What is the secret of happiness? Like, like right now, what would be the secret to you being happy? What would fulfill your life? If, if you were given several wishes right now, you could have anything you wanted, what would you wish for? What would be the secret to your happiness? That's what we're gonna talk about today. I, I kind of made a, a list. If we figure out what we're gonna talk about today, this is, this is a list of things that would begin to show up in our lives. How many of you would like to have more energy? Am I the only one? Okay. How many of you would like to have more energy, less expenses, less anxiety, less relational conflict, and more overall satisfaction in life? Does that sound pretty good? Okay, good, because that's what we're selling today. We've been in this series called In Everything You Do. And we're talking about being on God's, God's path. Not just talking the talk, because faith is not just about mental assent. It's not just mentally uh, agreeing. Faith is actually about what we choose to do in, in life. The flow of faith is to believe, is to trust, and to trust is, is to obey. And the reality is, in, in the realm of Scripture, we're not really trusting God. We're not really believing in God until we follow it up with, with action. Today, we're going to talk about the secret of happiness. And here's, here's the challenge of today. What I'm going to share with you from, from God's Word is the exact opposite of what our culture says will bring us happiness. And it's going to be a challenge. I, I will tell you this, at all of our locations, before the service started today, people prayed over the seat that you are sitting in. And, and I'm really hoping that you and I today can, can grab a hold of what God has for us. And I'll also tell you this, what I'm going to talk to you about today, really personally convicting for me as, as, I, as I prepared the, the message. Somebody asked me one time, hey, do you always practice what you preach? And I'll just give you the honest answer, no. Jesus is the only one that practiced everything he preached. Are you with me? If I practice everything I preach, the world would be a better place, right? I mean, just think about this, just so you're not picking on me. If you did every right thing you know you're supposed to do, right? If you did everything you told, tell your kids to do, would the world be a better place? This was really personally convicting for me. We all need this message today. And I'll just tell you, if you and I will practice it, it will be for our, our good. I, I met a gentleman over at our South Gilbert campus. His name is Steve. And, and, I, and I, I wanted to go up and talk to him. One, because I haven't met him and he's in our church and I always want to meet new people. But two, he was wearing a Roger Staubach jersey. And if you don't know who Roger Staubach is, you're letting the best in life pass you by. Roger Staubach is a famous player for the Dallas Cowboys. When I was a kid growing up in Texas, I was a huge Roger Staubach fan. And so I saw Steve and he's wearing this jersey and I'm like, I, I gotta meet this guy. And we began to talk and he kind of told me a little bit of his story. And I've asked him to share part of that story with us. This is Steve, watch this. Hi, my name is Steve Humphreys. I've been coming to Sun Valley, my family and I, for about 10 years. I was a region president with U.S. Foods. U.S. Foods is a Fortune 150 company in the United States until I retired uh, July 3rd of this year. I was just planning on a typical retirement. I was planning on um, getting a new set of golf clubs and playing some golf and I had a fishing ride that I thought I might go fishing. In the spring, I listened to one of Chad's sermons about work, and he goes, do you know the word retirement's not in the Bible? And I was like, wait, what? Uh-oh, what does that mean? I am set up to retire here. <laughs> and I think, you know, for me, as I look back at my life, I always made an excuse for not volunteering. It was, um, 
I'm too busy with the kids on the weekend. You know, we got a soccer game on the weekend. Uh, I traveled a lot and I was tired. You know, I always, I always had good excuses. The little thing that kept tapping my head or pushing me in the back, like, what are you gonna do when you retire? Because there's no such word as retirement. The hardest step was to pick up the phone and call the church and ask, what could I do? So they started saying, well, we need somebody to help with coffee. And so I volunteered for that. And so I began to um, clean out the coffee room each week and help with the supplies. And you know, then that kind of led to walking by the auditorium one day and I saw the, the guys in there stacking chairs. And I walked in and asked if they needed any help. And they said, sure. And the satisfaction that I get from stacking those chairs. It's kind of like when you put each chair in place, there's a little thought that runs through your head. And it's like, who's gonna sit in this chair today? What's going on in their life today that I know God is the only one that can fix it. And you do that like 500 times. Uh, it, it's a blessing. It's a real blessing. I don't know what's next. And I'm happy if the rest of the years of my life, God lets me stack chairs and clean coffee and shake hands, that's cool. You're never more like Jesus when you give and when you serve and over the years I've given, but I've never served. And now that I've started to serve, I see why they say both because uh, it's such a blessing. The church just made it so easy to get involved in all sorts of things and, and they're needed, whether it's in the children's ministry, whether it's in facilities, whether it's in greeting on Sundays, there's so much that needs to be done. And there's an old saying that says, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. And I can't go back and change the past. I can't go back and volunteer 10 years ago, but I can volunteer today. And that's what I feel like I've been called to do, is to serve uh, any way I can to help this church grow and help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. How many of you thought what Steve shared was really cool? Can I just see a show of hands, all locations? Okay. How many of you thought it was really weird? Can I see? Okay, because it's okay to be fully honest here in, in our church. I'm going to tell you why I think it's just a little bit weird. This guy comes to church, gives his money, and works for free. That's weird. I mean, where, where else, where else would you be like, hey, I'm gonna give you my money and, and, I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna work for free. And, 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 here, and here's the other thing. This dude's like set, right? C-suite executive, ready for retirement. I'm gonna golf and I'm gonna fish and that's all I'm gonna do. And now he's stacking chairs. I, uh, I did a funeral this past week at South Gilbert. A friend of mine's mom passed away. I've actually known her for years and years as well, and I was honored to do that funeral. And Steve was there uh, moving furniture around. And I said, you know, we're sharing your story uh, this week, like this weekend is, is the week. And we had this little exchange. And he said, are you going to say anything about me? And I said, yeah, I'm going to say you're weird. Because isn't that the American dream, right? Like, 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 like you work your whole life. You work really hard your whole life. In fact, you stress yourself out uh, earning money. Like you stress yourself out earning money and losing your health so that you can retire and spend all your money trying to get your health back. You know that's how a lot of us do it. And Steve is a lot more healthier than that. But, but that's... That's what we do. This idea that we're gonna work all of our lives so that at some point we can sit around and watch Netflix. And, 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 and we make that our, our goal. What, what, really, what really brings happiness? Because if you're thinking to yourself, I will be happy when, I, I wanna push on that today. I'll be happy when, fill in the blank. I'll be happy when I retire. I'll be happy when my salary gets to here. I'll be happy when I get married. I would be happy if something happened different here in this marriage. On and on and on and on it goes. 
when would you be happy? Is it possible that all the things that we think will bring satisfaction and happiness and joy in, in, in our life, could, could it be possible that we're not thinking right? Could it be possible that over the past few weeks, as we've looked at the book of Proverbs, as, as we've heard this verse again, again, and again, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Could it be that we hear that and we're like, yeah, 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 but we actually believe and practice something totally different. And could it be that what we think is going to make us happy and satisfied is not going to make us happy and satisfied. It's just going to frustrate us. See, what we're going to talk about today is, is the secret of happiness. And the secret of happiness is not more. The secret of happiness is wrapped up in this word. This word is a powerful word, but this word does not really fit well in our culture. It's the word contentment. Contentment. You have never seen a commercial that was trying to fuel your contentment. You have never experienced any marketing of any kind that was trying to help you be more content. I mean, what's the goal of marketing? I'm gonna help you. It's to make you miserable. The goal of marketing is to let you know why your life is not what it could be. So buy this product, do this thing, do what I say. That's, that's the goal of it. And yet we're all thinking that more is going to do it. We're all thinking if we just get to this point where we don't have to do anything anymore, then maybe that's gonna solve it. And yet we hear from this guy who's going, you know what? I'm finding a lot of satisfaction and joy in stacking chairs. And, and I'm gonna give my money and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna work for free. That's the exact opposite of everything our culture tells us. And yet there's a beauty in it. Could it be that God wants weirdness for all of us? And could it be that weirdness, really getting on God's path, I, I'm talking about, not talking about it, but doing it, could it be that that weirdness actually leads us to a place that's quite, that's quite wonderful? I mean, honestly, do you really want to be normal? In our culture, do you want to be normal? Do you know what normal is? Normal is stressed out. Normal is broke. Normal is relationally dissatisfied. Normal is a chasing after something that we won't seem to ever catch. Could it be, could it be that it's wonderful to be a little weird? I, I want weirdness for, for you. I want weirdness for me. I said it a moment ago, as I prepared the message for today, I thought, man, I needed this. Because when we talk about contentment, we're talking about a decision. You and I are as happy as we choose to be. And if you are waiting on the world to make you happy, you will be waiting a long, long time. Instead of waiting on happiness to happen to you, you've got to happen to happiness and bring it to the world. And it's wrapped up in this word, con contentment. Think about this with me and then we're going to dive into the Bible here. There are two ways to have enough. You can either work more and more or you can want less. I'm going to say that again because it's pretty good. I worked really hard on it. <laughs> there are two ways to have enough. You can work more and more or you can choose to want less. How free would you be if you could discover contentment? 
We've been in the book of Proverbs in this series, and I'm going to show you some Proverbs today. But I want to show you this passage of Scripture as we begin in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. The Apostle Paul is writing this young pastor, Timothy, and, and he's talking to people about money. And my guess is, Timothy lived in Ephesus. He was nervous to talk to the church about money. Can you believe that? Because he's like, people in my church are going to feel weird when I talk to them about, about money. Because money's always weird to talk about in, in church, trusting God in, in everything. And yet money is a big deal. If we're really going to trust God with our lives, money's going to be part of that. And so the Apostle Paul is writing the young pastor Timothy, and he's talking about teaching on money. And he says this to Timothy, but godliness with, here's the word, contentment is great gain. You and I think that more is great gain, but the Bible says that contentment is, is great gain. And then he says, for we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And then he continues. People who want to get rich fall into temptation. And, and specifically, because this was originally written in ancient Greek, when it says people who want to get rich, here's literally what it says. People who are always wanting more, always wanting more always wanting more. People who want to get rich, people who are always wanting more, fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So let me just point this out. Does this verse say that money is the root of all kinds of evil? No, it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of, of evil. Let, let, me, let me just point this out to you. Uh, money is, is, is neutral. God doesn't have a problem with, with money. What God has a problem with is sin. And money's not sinful. People are sinful. Does this make sense? And what happens is, when, when our discontentment fuels us and drives us for more and more and more and more, what happens is we start loving money and using people. When God's desire for our life is to love people and, and use money. But, but God doesn't have a problem with money. In fact, if you were here last weekend, if you weren't here, you can go online and watch and listen to that, that sermon. The Bible actually tells us how to build wealth. And I talked about it last weekend. God doesn't have a problem with money. He just has a problem with the worship of money. So we're to love God and we're to use money. We're to love people and we're to use money. But what the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy here is, tell the people if they're always wanting more and always wanting more, there's a trap in that. In Proverbs, Solomon writes that the borrower is slave to the lender. Have you heard that before? So if you and I go spend money we don't have on things we don't, need things we can't afford to impress people we don't know, we can fall into a trap. The, the more dumb debt you have, the more stuck you are. I mean, there's all these kinds of things that we know are true, but here's what we're talking about today. Could it be, could it be that our biggest financial issue is not the way we manage things? It's not the way we do accounting and our spreadsheets. Could it be that our biggest final financial issue is our, is our hearts? And this is really, really hard in our society because our society keeps us laser focused on what we do not have. And yet this more and more and more and getting more and more and needing more and more, at least think we need more and more, all of that, all of that leads to ruin and destruction in our lives. And all the while, God doesn't have a problem with money. He has a problem with the worship of it. When we, when we trust that things are going to satisfy our lives in, instead, of, instead of God. So if you're asking yourself, 
like, you know, self-examination, if you're asking yourself, do I love money? Well, here would be the question. Well, are you trusting God when it comes to your money? Because if that is not part of the practice of your life, it could be that you love money and you trust money more than, more than God. And this is a big deal. Because it means you're off the path. And anytime you're off the path, there's, there's danger. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It's like a scary movie in Proverbs because everything's the principle of the path. And all throughout it as he writes it, he's like, stay on the path. And yet this is a big deal because it pushes on our, on our hearts. Our biggest financial issue is, 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 is not our ability to, to manage or our inability to manage. The biggest issue when it comes to our money and the issues there is our, is our heart. And that's why people get, get trapped. That's why he, he writes it this way. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of problems, of all kinds of, of, e, of evil. And then he says, says this. I need you guys to help me in the booth. My clicker is not working. There we go. Never be afraid to ask for help. Just write that down. In there. <laughs> Some people eager for money have even wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with, with, many, with many griefs. When I, when I read that, I, I thought about when I was a little bit younger and, and again, I would, I would buy things I couldn't afford with money I didn't have to impress people I didn't know. And it was so fun when I got it, but then the fun went away because something else was coming. And that something else was a visitor to my home and that something else's name is Bill. <laughs> and I didn't like Bill. And it's like over time, if I really think about it, because it took my, my wife and I a while to kind of crawl out of the hole of stupid spending that I did in my 20s, but it was like I was taking that credit card and stabbing myself with many griefs. And the scripture just came to life. I just pierced myself and my wife in the beginning of my marriage with, with many griefs. Because the borrower is slave to, 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 to the lender, our culture keeps us laser focused on what we don't have. And, and, and if you have to use credit to, to get it, look at me. If you have to use credit to get it, I'm not talking about a house. I, I, I'm talking about liabilities, right? Not assets. If you have to use credit to get it, you can't afford it. And it will cost you a whole lot more in, in, in the long run. I mean, there's all kinds of things in the realm of what we're gonna talk about today. How free would you be? How free would I be if we could learn contentment? God's path, said it last week, best financial advice in the history of the world. You give first, you save second, and you live on the rest. By the way, there were a lot of people in our church last weekend who chose to begin to honor God in their finances. Can we just celebrate that right now? It's a huge step of faith. And for those of you who made that decision, I'm, I'm super proud of you. I, I, I know that when you start putting skin in the game, you know, you really begin to, to walk by faith. And so that's a huge step. We give first because that honors God. Anytime we receive income, we acknowledge first where it came from. Talked about that last weekend. We save second because that builds wealth over time. And this is part of God's will for us to prepare for the future. Steve was talking about retirement. There's nothing wrong with having enough money to where you don't have to work for money anymore. But the idea that you just sit around and do nothing, that's the problem. Does that make sense? But you build wealth over time through saving and investing. So we give first, we save second. Here's what I wanna talk about today, living on the rest. That's the power of contentment. That's the power of contentment. And here's the thing about contentment. It actually gives you the ability to build wealth. It actually gives you the ability to honor God. If you don't learn contentment, you will never be at a place financially where you can honor God and build wealth over time because you will spend more than you make because you live in a society where you are able to do that. I said this a couple of weeks ago. I'll remind you of it. So I read this study. Japanese people, people in Japan are saving 25% of their income. People in Europe are saving 15% of their income. The average American is spending 1% more than they make. 
You will never get ahead financially if you are spending more than you make. This heart thing, this contentment thing is a big, big deal. It's actually the secret to financial freedom. I'm gonna say that again. It's the secret to financial freedom. It's the secret to peace in your life. It's the secret to to less worry. It actually provides more life and more relational health because you're not worried about money all all the time. This is a big, big deal. Contentment is, is huge. So how to become content. I'm gonna give you four things today you can follow along with me on the Sun Valley app. Number one, remember that life is not found in playing and possessions. I put playing on there because we think life is found, you know, on a vacation, and a vacation is good, but here's the problem with that kind of thinking. We are experience rich and relationship poor. If you're taking notes, write that down. We're experience rich and relationship poor. This is why you can go to Disneyland, and everybody in the line with you is arguing with one another. Have you ever seen this? You're like waiting to get on the ride, and people are arguing, And you're thinking to yourself, what's the problem here? We're the happiest place on earth. (laughs) Why are you arguing? Here's why. Because we think the experience is going to do it when we haven't practiced the relationship all year long and those frustrations are coming out in the line at at Disneyland. And next time you go, just just watch that happen. Because that's what's happening. We we haven't talked to each other, so now all those frustrations are, are catching up with us. Life is not about playing and possessions. If you're taking notes, you can write this to the side. Life is about relationships. That that is what life is about. In fact, the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships. We all think it's about more. We all think it's about something new, but the reality is it's it's about relationships. This is Proverbs 11.24. Solomon writes this, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. If you and I think that life is about getting and getting and getting and getting and getting, our life is not expanding. The Bible says it's, it's, actually, it's actually shrinking. All of life surrenders to the flow of receiving and giving. I'm gonna prove it to you right now. I'm alive because in this moment, I have the ability to receive and to give. You wanna watch me do it? Watch this, here's why I'm living. I can receive and give. I'm gonna receive. And now I'm gonna give. And I cannot have life without surrendering to that flow. Receiving and giving, receiving and giving. Let's keep it biological just for a second. I'm gonna eat food later and I'm gonna receive, and at some point, (laughs) I'm gonna give. It's the circle of life, right? That's just how it works. Did you know that's how your soul is? Your soul wasn't created to be a reservoir, it's created to be a river. And the more you surrender to that flow, the more you, you grow. We receive from God, blessings from him. Now we work, but he gives us the ability to do that. We, we receive and, and we give. We receive and, and, and we give. And if all we do is receive, our soul actually begins to self-destruct. The soul must learn to let go and surrender and, and give because the soul self-destructs in the realm of of selfishness. Our world, if it's just get, 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 doesn't get larger, it gets smaller. Jesus said this in Luke 12, 15. He says, watch out. You know why he says it this way? Because we have to watch out. When's the last time you thought to yourself, I think I'm greedy? Nobody ever talks about greed. When's the last time you had a sermon on it? Besides, I talked about it last weekend if you were here. You never hear about this. And yet it's a huge issue, especially in our culture. This is why Jesus says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now we read this, but let me ask you this. Do you believe it? Do we we live like it? because our society keeps us laser focused on what we don't have. Relationships are what life is all about. Life is about receiving 
and giving. I, I wrote um, some things in the context of always wanting more. And you won't have time to write these down. I'm going to go through them quick. But you can go back and, and listen, perhaps, if you want to write them down and think about it. Always wanting more does several things. Always wanting more brings fatigue. The more that you have, the more energy it takes to maintain it. That's just the truth. If you win the rat race, you're still a rat. <laughs> Always wanting more makes us tired. Because to get more, you can either work more and work more and work more, or you can learn contentment and just want less. Always wanting more brings more expenses. I wrote this down. If the grass is greener, so is the water bill. <laughs> Everybody over 45, remember when you used to dream about the salary that you make right now? I heard a guy literally say this two years ago, and I'll always remember it. He says, I used to dream of the salary that I'm now starving on. More, 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 more. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. God promises to provide for our needs, not our greeds. Always wanting more brings more anxiety. The more you have, the more you have to worry about. This is a little sidebar for me. I never worry about getting barnacles on my yacht. I don't have one. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 5.12 says that insomnia increases with income. The more that you have, the more you have to worry about. The fewer things you have, the fewer worries you have. Always wanting more, here's another one, brings more relational conflict. The number one cause of divorce in America is arguments over money. It's moved from till death do us part to until debt do us part. Fatigue, expenses, anxiety over money do not create an environment for joyful interaction. Last one I'll give you, always wanting more brings more dissatisfaction. Uh, just think about this. Can anybody remember what they got for Christmas last year? Always wanting more breeds dissatisfaction because it's never enough. Things don't change, but people do. Remember like you really wanted this thing and you're like, when I get this thing, then that'll finally do it. And then you got the thing. And a couple of weeks later, eh, Always wanting more, always wanting more. Life is not found in playing and possessions. It's found in God and people. How to be content, remember that. Number two, stop comparing myself to others. Stop comparing myself to others. Uh, this, this is a big one. Uh, it's the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. Uh, God talks about this in the big 10, meaning the big 10 commandments. This, this is in there. This is Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. God says, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word covet here in Hebrew literally means to pant after. You're going to remember this. It's to do this. <laughs> like when your dog gets really tired and needs a drink. It's to pant after. So you pant after your neighbor's house or you pant after your neighbor's spouse. Both are bad. Because you're coveting what somebody else has. Everybody look at me. You and I, here's what we have to learn. We have to learn how to admire without having to acquire. Admire without having to acquire. That's a, that's a big deal. Anytime I, I, I talk about coveting and, you know, don't covet what your neighbor has, I'm always reminded of one of my mentors, Pastor John Jenkins, and what he tells his church. And if you've been at Sun Valley for a while, perhaps you've heard me say this before. He'll talk about in his church, you know, he'll tell his people, don't covet what your neighbor has, you know. And, and he says, I have people in my church and they keep coming and telling me, God keeps blessing my neighbor, blessing my neighbor, blessing my neighbor. And I'm like, well, what do you tell them, Pastor Jenkins? I tell them, if God is blessing your neighbor, get grateful, because that means God is in your neighborhood. <laughs> huh? That's pretty good advice. <laughs> and social media is pushing that, isn't it? You know what social media does? It's we compare the crummy stuff in our life with somebody else's highlight reels. If you're taking notes, write this down. Where comparison begins, contentment ends. 
Comparison is, is the thief of, of joy. Admire without having to, to acquire. It's a big, big, big deal. I wrote this down. Social media, you know why it's called a selfie? Because narcissistic is too hard to spell. A lot of times, all that's going on, and there's a dark reality beneath it. To be content, we've got to stop comparing ourselves to other people. Three, learn to enjoy what I already have. Learn to enjoy what I already have. Um, I'll just ask you this. Do you enjoy what you have? The secret to contentment is gratitude, and peace is the fruit of gratitude. I'm going to say that again. The secret to contentment is gratitude, And peace is the fruit of gratitude. Learn to enjoy what you already have. The word repent means to rethink. The word repent in your Bible means to do a 180 in your thinking. You're thinking this way, repent, stop thinking that way, and think, think this way. So when you're focused on what somebody else has and you're starting to get jealous about that, here would be God's advice to you. Repent, change your... Thinking, what you focus on is what you move towards. So you repent, and instead of going with the greed, I wish I had that, you go with gratitude, and it begins to change your, your heart. What, what, what are you thankful for? I've traveled a little bit, and anytime I travel to another country, I get real thankful real fast. I am thankful for hot showers. I am thankful for toilet paper, because you don't know what you got till it's gone, Right? <laughs> And when you travel around, you you begin to experience these kinds of things. I am thankful for ice. I like ice in my drink. What, what What are you thankful? What are you thankful for? Learn to enjoy what you already have. This is one of my favorite verses. I'm going to memorize it. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions, God doesn't have a problem with wealth and possessions, and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, This is a gift of of God. Just because you have wealth and possessions doesn't mean that you enjoy them. You know anybody that had more than you that was miserable? Do I need to go through the Hollywood run right now? People who are better looking than all of us? People who are richer than all of us? People who have more fame than all of us? And and, and yet, yet there's some misery there. God gives us the ability to enjoy what we have, and we do that by honoring him. Bible says this, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Solomon writes this in Ecclesiastes. He says, never having enough, it's like chasing after the wind. You never catch the wind. There's, there's no end to it. Remember that life is not found in playing in possession. Stop comparing yourself to others. Learn to enjoy what you already have. And number four, focus on what will last forever. Focus on what will last forever. We came into the world with nothing. We will leave with nothing. There are two big themes in your Bible. One is salvation and the other is stewardship. Salvation is the work of God and through the person of Jesus that changes our souls now and forevermore. That's salvation. If the Bible's not talking about salvation, then I'll make you this promise. It's talking about stewardship. God owns it all. We're managing what he's given us for a time. All of the scriptures is salvation and and stewardship. Remember what lasts forever. It's God. and and people. Solomon said this in Proverbs 21, 26, some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to what? To give, because they realize it's from God. They realize it's a blessing from him, and they receive, and they give, and their soul experiences more and more life. They receive, and and they give. Jesus said this in the greatest sermon ever preached, seek first God's kingdom, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things that we worry about, concern ourselves with, all these things that we need, all these things will be given to you as as well. So I'll just ask you, right? How you doing with this? Everything that God says is for your good. 
because he loves you. And I can just tell you, when I am like fully vested on the path that God has for me, it's wonderfully weird. Because it's what's best. Our problem is not that we don't love God enough. Our problem is we don't realize how much he loves us. Because if we realized his love for us, we would always trust him and do what he says. So you wanna give first, you wanna save second, and you wanna live on the rest. Learn contentment. Um, I gave this challenge last week. Many of you stepped up. I'm gonna challenge you again today. Get on God's path. If you wanna begin to give first to God and then through the church, you can go online, set up a recurring giving. That's what my wife and I do. Anytime we receive income, a percentage of that goes to God. We give 10%. It's called a tithe. You can give above and beyond. That's special offerings and things like that that we have come. For many of you, you've never given anything. You can give for the first time. But begin to get on God's path. It's what's best for you. If you want to do that, you can text the word PATH to 48000. We'll text you right back, give you instructions, or you can go to path.sv.cc. I'm going to end where we started. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. If you didn't get it last week, on the way out today, we have a bracelet for you. It's reversible. On the black side, it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. On the other side, that's yellow. It says, in everything I do. And let's just trust God in everything we do. Let me pray for you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your grace and for who you are. I pray that you would give us wisdom of these things and that we would take a step. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that your ways are best. And may we trust you in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen.